welcome back to a very important session of fourth edition of health and innovation conclave organized by abec news network is the first day and this session is all about re-strategizing hospital management to fulfill the needs of the new world order challenges and opportunities and for that we have eminent speakers thought leaders with us from the hospital ecosystem across the southern part of the country let me first introduce to all of you we have with us raja Rajan S, Chief Operating Officer, MGM Healthcare. We welcome Mr. Rajan Rajan. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have with us Dr. Vijay Singh, Directions, Operations and Medical Services, Karnataka Cluster, Narayana Health. We welcome Dr. Vijay. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have with us Manisha Kumar, Cluster Chief Operating Officer, HCG Hospitals. We welcome Manisha. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have with us Adra Kurian, Chief Strategic Management Officer, Raja Giri Hospital. We welcome Arta Kurian. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam, Strategic Advisor, Yashoda Hospitals. We welcome Dr. Prabhu as well. Uh, before we start the session, just let me give a perspective about this event. Today and tomorrow, this event is happening where we are trying to get the thought leaders, the hospital CXO community, innovators and industry leaders coming together to discuss and deliberate upon various aspects of building the comprehensive healthcare ecosystem where focusing on the futuristic hospital or health infrastructure with a special focus on resilience. And today in the inaugural, we had seen the presence of MD NHM of Kerala, Dr. Ratan Kelkar, who spoke at length about his thought and vision on how technology is being leveraged in the state of Kerala, especially when it comes to healthcare service delivery. And we also had the presence of GS Naveen Kumar, IS Special Secretary, Health Government of Andhra Pradesh, who talked about the importance of emerging technologies and how the policies could be uh, formed, uh, keeping in mind the importance of technology. And we also have Dr. K. Madan Gopal, Senior Consultant Health, Nitya Government of India, who talked about the vision behind the National Digital Health Mission and how Government of India along the state government is trying to transform the India's healthcare scenario in a big way, especially with technology and innovation. And then we had an industry presentation by Preston and two panel discussions, one on the uh, building digitally resilient healthcare ecosystem and also one on hospital infrastructure. And now uh, we, have, we have the session on re-strategizing hospital management to fulfill the needs of the new world order, challenges and opportunities. As we all know, the preparing a hospital to play its role in coping with an epidemic and post-pandemic most considered its role in the overall national and local community response. The hospital will have to act on policies and decisions made by national and local health officials. At the same time, hospitals must relook various aspects of hospital management, such as finance, IT, OT, optimal use of human resources, cost, sustainability model as well. The session will try to find answers on solutions to the challenges of managing hospitals in a new scenario. With this, let's let's have a perspective from uh, Raja Rajan Ness, Chief Operating Officer, MGM Healthcare. Raja Rajan, uh, should hospitals be now always ready with an emergency management committee? Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, see, uh, today's uh, scenario is completely different. Uh, the world that we know has changed uh, completely, uh, especially in the last two years. So it is uh, definitely important to have a medical response uh, committee. Uh, and uh, we did have one. Uh, it's like uh, having a presidential rule uh, in such uh, situations. So we have this uh, committee called the COMRT, which we had formed. Now we have uh, uh, formalizing it as a medical response team for any uh, this thing it has. A handful of doctors and all admin uh, staff members and also the various other action oriented people in the hospital. So uh, it gives a very uh, rounded perspective of the uh, threat or the challenge that we are facing. So that's going to be the future. We need to be ready and uh, responsive to the community that we serve. So my take on that is yes, we do need that. Yeah. So is this has been a biggest lesson of the pandemic? or this was there earlier as well it uh, i think this is the second most important lesson that we learned in the pandemic uh, prior to the pandemic uh, there was a lot of focus on technology innovations and uh, 
you know even digitization uh, aspect got pushed I, I, that would be my third on the list but uh, first thing that which we knew uh, uh, which the pandemic made us realize was the importance of the human resources our fellow employees and uh, the people that whom we treat our patients and uh, the entire uh, emotional uh, quotient uh, journey that uh, we are here uh, in the healthcare journey uh, at right at the forefront uh, of uh, this uh, covid war and uh, the kind of uh, uh, stories that uh, the human touch stories that we came across and stuff so i i would rate uh, the hr thing uh, to be the first the second most important thing that came out of it is the the emergency preparedness and the medical response uh, team that needs to be in place and uh, the third thing which uh, I, i'm really happy uh, and as you had mentioned earlier sessions also cover that in detail the entire digitization push that which has happened into the healthcare industry uh, which is a welcome sign a welcome sign the, the learning of the pandemic that's what uh, rajaran uh, rajarajan was uh, saying let's see how dr vijay singh uh, thinks about this dr singh your thoughts on this that now uh, every hospital should have an emergency management committee or the responsive team uh, where we uh, apprehend or preempt what is coming uh, uh, there and we are prepared accordingly <coughs> Uh, yeah, so I I agree with uh, Mr. Rajan, and uh, when it comes to the emergency committee or emergency management committee of services, I think the rules of the game have or game has always been there. Only thing is the importance and the realization of the the the, the crucial aspect of this uh, emergency committee has uh, now been realized of late. and uh, the pandemic has actually triggered or precipitated the need of all these uh, uh, aspect of healthcare management for that matter and uh, as far as the it and optimization of the manpower resources is concerned no doubt uh, there has been a huge uh, uh, transformation in the way the resources have been utilized because the flooding of the hospitals and then uh, non availability of the uh, resources for the kind of management and uh, putting up critical care resources across the hospital it is not limited only to 20 or 30% of the hospital assets but also the whole hospital needed to be uh, equipped with critical care resources so so i, I do agree that uh, uh, there is always a need there has always been a need right and this is only kind of precipitated or or uh, got us to realize the importance of this whole thing as such right right as dr vijay was saying that the, this this kind of infrastructure or the uh, the ecosystem was always there but perhaps the realization of the crucial aspect of uh, emergency emergency management committee or the optimal use of resources uh, is uh, realized in a way which has never been done before uh, maybe that has been a biggest lesson out of the pandemic that's what dr vijay singh was saying let's have a perspective from manisha kumar cluster chief operating officer HCG Hospital, Manisha, your thoughts on that? Yeah, right. Uh, so, we I agree with the, both the panelists that spoke before me. Um, we were faced with uh, this pandemic head-on in my hospital. Uh, we uh, managed about two fifty, three hundred COVID patients per day. And uh, while we always had uh, a, a, a committee, a medical practices committee, to take emergency on-ground decisions, I think it really got activated. and it worked the most uh, when we were faced with covid pandemic um it is a place where uh, key clinicians uh, clinical departments paramedics and management work together hand in hand and i think the value of uh, teamwork uh, we realized the best when we were trying to manage uh, covid pandemic uh, uh, we were uh, we had to think on our feet think outside the box and come up with solutions uh, from day one of the pandemic whether it was uh, triaging uh, contact tracing admitting then um a treatment protocols infection control protocols and so many things had to be devised from scratch in a matter of days rather hours uh, so many times and uh, we also uh, thought out of the box for i think raj raj in said in the beginning that uh, technology disruption i mean covid 19 really disrupted healthcare and while we had a lot of technology available uh, to us and you know around in the ecosystem before but we really 
um, decided to use it uh, the most during COVID pandemic, whether it is uh, telehealth, teleconsultation to keep in touch with our patients. Uh, we had to uh, expand our infrastructure, not literally, but uh, practically to take in more patients than our maximum hospital capacity. And uh, we had to expand critical care and just take in more patients while working with the same uh, medical infrastructure, same number of doctors and nurses. And we set up step down ICUs, tele ICUs. We used remote monitoring and uh, um, you know so many technology enablements and interventions. Uh, which we all collectively decided, um, implemented, and, uh, and 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 all these things helped us uh, treat many more patients than what we ever thought was our capacity uh, when we were faced with the pandemic. And uh, a lot of it has sustained. Uh, of course, there has been waxing and waning of COVID. We've seen three waves. Um, we really can't say what the future holds, but now there is a little bit of stability in the ecosystem. But a lot of measures and interventions that we took, uh, we have made them sustainable, whether it is technology enablements, whether it is telehealth. A lot of it uh, we have uh, imbibed as part of process and uh, uh, as part of our system and have made it um, sustainable so that uh, that is something that we uh, 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 we keep uh, following and we keep the momentum on uh, on that going forward whether pandemic or no pandemic and, and treat it as a BAU so that's been one of the uh, great outcomes of this exercise right right uh, if I take a crux of what Manisha has said that value of teamwork has been realized more than ever uh, during the during the pandemic and post pandemic we are still going through pandemic and we hope that it will be over soon. If not, because there's again a new IIT research is saying that June, maybe June 2022, again, we'll see the fourth wave. God forbid it doesn't come, but we have to be prepared for that. Let's have a perspective from uh, Adra Kurian, Chief Strategic Management Officer. Uh, Ms. Kurian, your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so my thoughts do not differ from what the earlier panelists said. Now, see, this emergency management team, uh, this concept or uh, this committee was probably there like 15, 20 years ago in most of the accredited facilities because accreditation makes it a norm. You know, you have to have an emergency management committee team formed as part of your accreditation process. So uh, most of the accredited hospitals definitely had that team there. But uh, having the team come into action was something that happened off late. And in Kerala, uh, I'm sure all of you recall the uh, Nipah uh, outbreak that we had in North Kerala. And the same year, 2018, we had the floods as well. So those two events really sort of, you know, hit the bulb for us. And both the public and the private health sector in Kerala, uh, everyone was compelled to create a more organized framework for, you know, being prepared. Uh, you know, uh, recovery and uh, how do you uh, respond to such an outbreak? So those episodes really set the groundwork for, uh, we can say mostly all the hospitals in Kerala. Um, uh, those two incidents were really eye openers. And uh, of course, see, uh, from those learnings, a lot of our framework was also developed on that. And uh, just like my hospital, I'm sure many other hospitals in Kerala, we took a lot of learning from the, what the Kerala state government had done in 2018 and from the ICMR. So we were able to uh, establish protocols for point of care tests. We were able to uh, intensify the contact tracing process. Uh, uh, infection control trainings were enhanced among healthcare workers. So, uh, you know, the last three, four years, all of this has been on a roll. And when COVID came in, uh, you know, everything just sort of got into place a lot stronger. And um, again, uh, see the government, uh, especially here in Kerala, I'm sure the other states do as well. Uh, the, direct, the Directorate of Health Services here, uh, they have been very active during the entire process. I mean, even during the Nipah time and following on. So by the time COVID came in, our government sort of knew what exactly needed to get done. And so there were notifications, guidelines that kept coming in really fast. And for uh, healthcare organizations to sort of keep up with that, you know, uh, one member of our emergency management committee was definitely working very closely with the local governments. 
uh, because there was a constant flow of communication from the local authorities that really guided us through. And uh, uh, our state government, we had the COVID-19 Jagrita site that was put up. So uh, private healthcare clears, uh, the public hospitals, all of us had to uh, update uh, patients' uh, uh, status, you know, all the positive cases. Every following day, we had to update their uh, health status. So the doctor kept uh, keep going on on a regular basis. And for that, you know, we had to be as good as the, uh, the, uh, the requirement set by the government. And uh, our, um, uh, the emergency management committee, you know, one of the best parts of this kind of a committee is that you have a lot of different heads working together. Uh, of course, the top management, you have the medical and nursing administration working there, you have the finance coming into play, you have the materials and the purchase team coming into action. Uh, and here we also had uh, the clinical epidemiologist as well come into this particular committee. And during the COVID time, the uh, committee was uh, renamed as the Global Communicable Diseases Committee, GCD committee. And it was this committee that met on a daily basis. And that was the committee that sort of set the guidelines, the, uh, you know, the protocols for every uh, staff or, or management of every patient in the hospital for all these past many months. And uh, it was also that committee that sort of, you know, thought on their feet. Um, for example, uh, we, you know, we had, uh, all of you were doing the same process. We had to sort of uh, do um, contact tracing. And initially we started out with handwritten documents, you know, handwritten surveys at the, at the entrance of the hospital. Uh, in a day or two, we kind of realized that that's becoming a very cumbersome process. We had an extremely long queue outside our hospital and that couldn't continue. So in a matter of just a month, you know, whatever in-house software engineers were available, we didn't go for any external apps. You know, that's again where, uh, uh, as my uh, other panelists said, uh, you know, uh, digitalization, uh, it was the best time for digitalization in uh, our hospitals, in our healthcare sector because we were able to develop a very simple in-house app uh, that was able to screen the patients so quickly at uh, the entrance. And this digital platform made it really fast to uh, enter the data. And in fact, we, uh, for every patient who took an appointment, we would even send them a message, an SMS reminding them that, you know, you could log in to this fast track app and uh, uh, make the entry, data entry there. So you didn't have to wait at the uh, checkpoint. And anybody who was found to have any symptoms, uh, in fact, even the containment zones, uh, particularly in this app, we were able to update the containment zones uh, based on the information, daily information we got from the government. So uh, that way we feel, uh, I feel definitely for sure the emergency management committee is definitely uh, uh, an essentiality in every hospital and it's here to stay because we are not talking medical emergency, we are talking any kind of emergency. You know, the, that uh, collective decision-making system is definitely here to stay, and it's a big positive for all hospitals. Yeah, so that's why. Right, right. As um, uh, Ardra was saying, that the lessons from Nipah has helped uh, during the COVID, uh, especially for Kerala, and uh, also a uh, uh, great thing is that the Emergency Management Committee has one member who works regular uh, coordination with the local government ecosystem. And you talked about how the local uh, digitization solutions act actually helped uh, in the management. And as you're saying that the emergency management committee is here to stay, though it was always there, but perhaps the need of emergency management committee has never been felt like this uh, before in the last 50, 70 years or so. Uh, I'll come back to you, but before that, let's have a perspective from the Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam, strategic advisor, Issue the hospitals and why I'm uh, forcing on or focusing on emergency management committee for the first up of this discussion. That is because uh, I was going through a document by the World Health Organization uh, after the first wave or second wave, where they prepared a document on how the hospitals world over should work together to build up, build up that comprehensive uh, hospital ecosystem. The first point which they mentioned is that uh, the need for uh, effective emergency management committee in hospital that is a need of the hour whether it was there or you have to make it in a new way that comes later but there has to be an emergency management committee for local coordination as as Raja Rajan, dr vijay singh manisha ji or uh, adva ji was saying that that is the importance of 
emergency management committee. So let's have a perspective from Dr. Prabhu Vinayaga. Dr. Prabhu, your thoughts on that? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to meet all of you, and uh, I look forward to meeting up even after this show. Um, one of the so I'm so as agreed by everybody, emergency preparedness program is one of the essential aspects of any you kind can of activity. So sorry, you can disagree also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be disagree. I'm going to be the devil's advocate. So, <laughs> right. so, um, so one of the important things. So, I was the managing director of Joint Commission International, and I see three hospitals here who are JCI accredited, uh, and I work with all three of you in terms of you know understanding of that. So, one of the most important aspect of emergency management preparedness program is that um, uh, it is definitely essential, and every hospital is supposed to identify at least four or five areas which it considers emergency, and do a complete program about emergency management preparedness and do a drill every year to ensure that everything is working in sync. And drill means actually there is an epidemic happening and therefore uh, everybody comes and participates like you do a fire drill. right? Uh, likewise, you're supposed to do an emergency preparedness program. So, um, but I don't see that happening most of the time. And thanks to COVID, it has helped us uh, to come and, uh, and take this subject as an important aspect of it. But the challenge that I face in currently and in, in my current hospital also where I'm advising, it becomes extremely difficult to make people understand that why this drill is important. Because this drill helps us to be, that is called as emergency preparedness. This drill helps us to find out all the loopholes that we try to, um, you know, build it when we are doing uh, an emergency preparedness program. And you try to plug those loopholes so that we don't get into such kind of a situation. Um, yes, uh, COVID, COVID has helped us in to come to this at least conclusion that emergency preparedness is an important thing. We may be ready for the next COVID wave. But what I also find is, what if there is a pandemic of Ebola? Are we ready for it? Right? So emergency preparedness seems to be a, a perspective which is happening because we went through a certain problem. And I don't still seem, I'm not, I'm not saying that none of your hospitals are doing or not doing. What I'm saying is, that seems that needs to be one of the most important aspects of every hospital of how we conduct drills and ensure those loopholes are being plugged. I also heard uh, we talk about uh, you know human resources are the most important. Um, yes, of course, without human resources, uh, nothing is going to happen. But I'm yet to see one hospital in the country which has got a robust human resources department, which is acting on all depart all aspects of human resources and not only in terms of hiring and firing. Um, I don't find that, honestly. And I think that's an important aspect of where we want to build our future of healthcare in India. We need to have a robot human resources department because the human resources people who come with that perspective understands how to manage. We all know how we manage our doctors. We all know how we manage our specialists. We all know how we manage our nurses. Each of them has got a different way to you know, manage them, to make them understand over the importance of various aspects and how are we able to uh, ensure that we implement them. Uh, so human resources is one of the areas that we currently lack. Uh, in terms of technology adoption, um, I mean, I don't think it was a no-brainer that technology is a very important aspect of improving efficiency within the hospitals. Um, we all know that not more than 10% of our clinicians use technology even today. I mean, there are HIIs and EMR available. How many hospitals can boast that 100% is implemented in their own hospitals? It is practically not happening. We are not adopting to technology as soon as we should do. And the typical example that I give usually is thermometer was invented 500 years before it was adopted to measure body temperature. You know, that's how delayed we are in adopting technology. It's an important aspect and technology makes efficiency much more faster, much more improved, and it makes life simpler for the nurses, for the people who work with us, so that they are able to do much better job, um, you know, if they adopt a proper technology. And for that, training is essential. Uh, we don't seem to be giving training to our healthcare professionals in adopting technology uh, that I think we should be focusing more on that in the future to come. Right, right. Uh, so important insights by Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam. Uh, if I take one or two points, what you have said that uh, one is the robust HR department. Uh, you see, uh, still there is a, a huge void in that. If you talk about even the bigger hospitals and also uh, take adoption is still slow. If you talk about the 100% adoption of technology by all the employees, all the clinicians, uh, it's still not there. Uh, that's that's We need to work on that. Uh, uh, 
uh, we are talking about uh, every one of you have talked about the uh, digital innovation part, digitalization aspect of that. Uh, let, let's have a perspective uh, from Dr. Prabhu and then I'll come to Adra, Manisha and so on. I'll just continue like that. Uh, in terms of the emerging technologies, if you talk about uh, managing a hospital ecosystem, um, do you think that there's still a long way to go uh, if we are there uh, in terms of leveraging emerging technologies that can be AI, IoT, robotics, remote access, whatever, blockchain? Uh, do you think the even the tier one hospitals uh, need to go a long way to adopt emerging technologies in a bigger way? Um, very, very long way. Um, I will start with that because we are talking about AI and, and blockchain and, you know, augmented reality and all that stuff. Uh, those are, uh, you know, two, two, I think 20, 200 years away. Uh, but first, what we have is there are technologies currently available. We have not yet started at least adopting the existing technology. We were talking about augmented reality, which is, you know, the next gen. But unless you adopt the existing technology, it is very difficult to go to the next stage, you know. Unless you know how to use a telephone, you can't use a mobile phone. It's, you know, leapfrogging needs to happen in health uh, healthcare. What I mean by leapfrogging is like from a, a wired telephone to a mobile phone is a complete leapfrog. And likewise in healthcare, and particularly in hospitals, we need to change that mindset and completely uh, transform ourselves into adopting technology. Yes, artificial intelligence, augmented reality and blockchain needs to come in. We have huge data. We have big data and a lot can be done with that data. We can prevent diseases that's the biggest important aspect. You know, we have taken Hippocrates' oath with saying that we need prevention is better than cure. Uh, but we are nowhere even getting. My into next that question will be on, on that uh, okay. on prevention and control. So please carry on. Please right. carry so, on. Yeah. But technology is is definitely an important and integral aspect of what we want to do in healthcare for the future. Um, but I find uh, the hospital management itself, when we when I try to persuade them to adopt technology, as simple as a, a, you know HIS and EMR or quality management system softwares. Um, there are enough softwares available to ensure that technology can be run. The good part again, what COVID did was at least the video consult has started, you know, so everybody started developing their own apps uh, within the hospital. And I, like Dr. like Ms. Korean had said that they have developed an Innos app to ensure, you know, a very easy and um, a way to uh, consult with their patients and how to track the patients while they're entering into the hospitals. So I know I'm, I have met with MGM and I know they're doing a great job in terms of, unfortunately, I have not been to meet other hospitals. I'm sure they're doing a great job as well in terms of uh, bits and pieces of improving technology where they possibly can with lowest kind of investment. But I think there needs to be a transitional uh, change of thought and in ensuring that the investment completely comes into technology first, because if you put your investment in technology, everything else can, gets kind of taken care of, uh, you know, a lot of um, staff work can be reduced. A lot of efficiencies can be improved, and you get data sets that is able to, that you are able to take decision on. The current data that you get from hospitals are just informations. I'm not able to take decisions on it. So I need a technology which is able to give me a data which will help me take decisions rather than just providing me information. So when I look at the CEO dashboard, the CEO dashboard is giving me information. It's not giving me a data which I'm able to make a decision on whether how my, you know, either my hospital is improving, either my hospital p &L is improving, or is it my quality processes are improving? I'm not able to make the decision. So I let it go and I go only uh, look at it as a day-to-day -day information that I'm getting in and look and act at only those information, which is kind of, you know, off the track. So yes, I, there, there has to be a, a, a transitional change in terms of how we understand technology and how we do it. Unfortunately, what happens is healthcare people who are in the healthcare, and, and I blame myself as being a doctor, we are not so open to accepting technology. Um, and that is the biggest challenge. If I can get all the clinicians accept technology as it is, and I, I can remove the entire paper out of my hospitals and make it paperless, and then that becomes a, a completely different story. Uh, it's not India's challenge, it's a global challenge. I'm finding it most hospitals across the world facing this typical issue. Okay. Okay. So let's let's make the best of the existing technologies, and in terms of embracing emerging technologies, long way to go. That was Dr. Prabhu's uh, take on that. Uh, Dr. Vijay, your thoughts on that? Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Prabhu that it is going to take a good amount of time to adopt these technologies. But one more thing is, 
See, India is a place where there is a certain amount of delay in adopting, but once it starts adopting, there's kind of growth in leaps and bounds. That is the beauty of Indian population as such or Indian systems. So uh, basically, uh, uh, I, I can I can uh, date back to something like 2005, wherein the telemedicine was well established by our organization or Apollo for that matter. And uh, there was a good amount of acceptance, but at the same time, not good enough to kind of bridge the gaps in healthcare system. So, and it is, it has been over a decade now that, uh, that the realization has actually gone through and then suddenly the pandemic has kind of brought in this realization for video consultations, for teleconsults and for, uh, and we were actually working on telediagnostics and tele ICU models and things like that. So there are certain good amount of initiatives that are on by quite many healthcare providers and healthcare technology companies working on this model. Uh, yes, there is a certain amount of delay by the providers to adopt this and uh, by the end users to adopt this. But however, today, we, we I think I think if I'm not wrong, we have crossed, uh, we have done close to about 10,000 or 12,000 teleconsults over the last few months during the pandemic. And the acceptance has been beautiful. In fact, it was it was uh, 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 wonderful to know that people from from remote corners of West Bengal also could uh, access and do a teleconsult with con consultants in Bangalore and things like that. So, uh, so at the end of the day, what, what I um, uh, what I would like to say is yes, it is going to take time. There is a good amount of technology that is kind of uh, brimming with uh, uh, initiatives uh, in healthcare system. There is a good amount of uh, adoption of the uh, AI and BI. Dr. Prabhu is mentioning about, okay, when it comes to business intelligence and all that, yes, uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, we are on some of the uh, BI tools uh, that help us to make some rapid decision making to know the real time progress of the patient care parameters and all that, whether it is, and, and all this is at a click of a button and more real time. Uh, but uh, no doubt, uh, uh, by the time all the healthcare providers adopt this for the betterment of healthcare delivery systems or for betterment of uh, uh, operations, hospital operations, it might take some time, but um, uh, I think, I think it, uh, it is just a matter of time. But once it starts rolling out, I'm sure that there will be rapid adoption of this across healthcare. Right, right, right. I will come back to Dr. Vijay. Uh, the, uh, Arja Kurian, your thoughts on that? Right. Um, see, now in, uh, in our hospital, 2017 was, you know, when we started telemedicine. And uh, over this time, in all of these last many years, since 2017, from 2020 onwards, we saw such a spike in telemedicine. Till then, not many doctors, even in our facility, thought about telemedicine existing. Okay, they didn't want to use the service. They preferred not to use the service. But uh, suddenly when COVID came in and we had the facility here, then there was a sudden surge in, in people adopting that. So it wasn't a matter of not being able to adopt it or not being tech savvy enough because you know almost all of us are on the net for many other reasons all the time so it wasn't that we weren't gadget friendly or we weren't uh, tech savvy it was just that we weren't ready to um, see a patient in that form you know through a, a through a, a channel through another medium that we'd rather have seen the patient in in, uh, in person again the same thing goes with the emr with the his but um my personal thought on that, see, uh, even though we talk about AI and blockchain and so many other technological, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of findings happening around, but even today, neither the nursing uh, um, uh, syllabus or the medical syllabus ever covers those kind of topics. We don't have that kind of a subject. You know, see, if our uh, doctors and our nurses and our paramedics had that subject, had one topic, one paper on that, you know, while they were coming out of their uh, curriculum, their educational course, they would have adopted to it much better because they know that this is the this is tomorrow. This is what I need to do tomorrow. Even today, we don't have, I don't know if any medical college has incorporated that yet. I, I doubt very much because I know the nursing institutions haven't done it right, uh, done it yet. 
And again, another aspect, you know, uh, some people ask is the cost factor. Now, yes, yes, it is true. Uh, there is a cost element involved in it. But uh, we have to look at it from a, um, a long-term perspective. Yes, there may be some uh, bit of cost involved. It, it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that we need to go for all the modules together at one shot. You know, we could go face by face as we move on, as we get comfortable with one, we move on to another one. And as Dr. Vinayagam said, you know, there's a lot of information available. We don't need all this information for our day-to-day -day work. We need data sets that get pulled out. We need very small reports that get pulled out of this. And that's all that needs to be presented to our top management, something that would make sense to them, which department is doing well, which is not doing well, rather than have all the numbers together there in front of them, right? And technology, as I see it, uh, is a mechanism to ease the workflow. You know, the manual uh, work that our staff had to be doing you know, take their time off that and get them to pay attention to the patient more. Talk to the patient more, interact with the patient more. That's what technology should be doing for us. So, um, I, I, yeah, as, as all of them said, you know, as uh, Dr. Nayam and Dr. Vijay Singh said, yes, we have a long, long way to go, but uh, it, it is correctable. Uh, now, a lot of the young doctors are adopting to it better, but like I said, maybe if our education system could incorporate that, yes, that would be a wonderful way to get more people to, you know, uh, actually adopt it faster. So, um, yes, I think that's that's my thought on this subject. Yes, thank you. Right, so uh, you're saying there's no dearth of data, but you always don't need that amount of data to take a decision rather you can have the synopsis of data in front of you take a quick decision and technology is here to make life easy not complex so if you can think in those lines we can move ahead in the right direction that's what uh Adra Kurian was saying uh let's have a perspective from Raja Rajanes I saw him smiling when Dr Prabhu was uh, speaking uh he must have something interesting to add on add to Raja Rajan your thoughts yeah see uh we need to look at uh, technology as an enabler and uh, that's how we were uh, doing it at MGM Healthcare. And uh, when Dr. Prabhu had come to our facility, he would have had that experience and uh, stuff and uh, seeing some of it and working. So one of the things is uh, I, I come from, I'm a life member of the Telemedicine Society of India. So I'm very happy to see all my panelists talk about telemedicine in uh, uh, such uh, length and breadth. Uh, one of the important thing is, uh, though telemedicine has been here in our country for 20, 25 years, uh, uh, what was important is to bring in a telemedicine practice guidelines. It took us 20, 25 years. But believe me, what we achieved in the last uh, 20 years, this last uh, one and a half, two years, we have uh, surpassed well uh, past that. Um, and uh, we've we, we've been uh, really educating a lot of people on technology and uh, I'm sure a lot of things, uh, you know, we were talking of AR, VR, uh, some of the things, uh, the uh, Microsoft, uh, Bagarmo, the HoloLens uh, kind of uh, thing. It's all going to come to India. But see, one of the important thing about uh, technology as an enabler is what is it that you require and what is the phasing that you want to do? You know, the right sizing and the phasing is going to be very important. So when... Uh, smaller hospitals don't have sight on it. Uh, they, they don't have a, 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 a CIO kind of a person who would guide them onto the uh, digital transformation roadmap that they need to take. Uh, people make mistakes of uh, going on cloud when they when their basic requirement could be an on-prem requirement. Uh, probably when you are looking at a multi-centric uh, uh, systems like, uh, say, a fellow panelists like... Uh, Narayana Health uh, would have their entire thing on cloud because accessibility and agility improves and stuff. So these are all the things. See, there are the, the, the kind of technologies that which we need to adopt today is, uh, as uh, Madam did mention, Adra uh, Kurian, the entry point screening systems, the real time location services for equipments which are moved from one area to another, like the ultrasound and echo related things. The, uh, the real-time location uh, system for tracking your health check patients where the uh, TAT time is going to be very, very important and the patient experience is what we want to achieve. 
the dashboards we were uh, many of my panelists were talking about dashboards and then uh, how much of uh, uh, data overload is happening on these dashboards uh, the the a lot of people are now talking about data visualization uh, we also know about the clinical decision support systems okay now nobody talks about in that lens with about the management decision support systems what is happening is today uh, for data we don't have a problem the important question is the data sanctity the important question is as uh, dr prabhu that's one of the areas where i think i smile uh, where how we are going to utilize this data you have you know uh, i have a very good portal management system which has optimized uh, my uh, uh, you know uh, portal transfer in the hospital because be, me being a vertical hospital with 11 floors and uh, uh, occupancy and stuff so uh, we really had to master this uh, when push comes to shove we need to get on and uh, get the action that's what covid did with the digital transformation and stuff but what happened to us as a group uh, was that we started our operation just before covid we are just a toddler we are just 3 years old and uh, we, we we have our directors who are all new age and uh, from the us and uh, uk getting into the best models and something which we set out as an organization is to brave the learning curve by having uh, responsible individuals coming in with their rich experience and starting not from uh, you know 10 yards or 20 yards back but from the word go so we were dropped into the war zone which made us uh, make this uh, digital transformation journey uh, a very uh, reality and stuff and there is uh, plenty of things which we need to achieve uh, you know ai is a far far way but ai uh, as a benefactor to healthcare is also spoken about and there is also uh, the eth eth ethical uh, related issues which we are still not uh, getting into it the uh, the digital neural networks the various other aspects uh, and more importantly the government drive and push really has to be appreciated when we talk of this whole uh, digital transformation did we ever even think of a covid app that could change the way or uh, arogya setu that could change the way 2 years back so that is something which we need to give it to the government and especially to the ndhm that they, they are putting uh, together and the sandbox i would urge all my fellow panelists and all the listeners to actually get access to the ndhm sandbox uh, to harmonize your data we are looking at something where in my hospital data would be seen in nh and nh hospital data would be seen in hcg and hcg hospital data would be seen in rajagiri making the patient data portability a reality so we are talking with respect to transformation it is a long way to go this could be easily achieved in bigger hospitals but it's it's time to focus on the smaller hospitals by taking those tiny steps towards uh, digitization or rather to get into a his to get into not i wouldn't even say an emr to get into having proper medical records at this point of time and uh, we are we are we are ages away from a complete digitization but the initiatives are on and uh, all of us uh, should be shaping it for the future thank you thanks for that right santam is it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's needed that you are faced with challenges in initial days and you come up with unique innovation solution to overcome those challenges that's what have been done with your hospital as you said uh, 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 kudos for that so let's have a perspective from manisha kumar manisha your thoughts on that yeah i think uh... um well most of it has been uh, covered i very much agree with everybody that's <coughs> um i have worked with large corporate hospitals uh, currently in hcg uh, i would say we are um far ahead in terms of using technology uh, i worked earlier with manipal max fortis and other places also uh, all the large corporate hospital chains have had a lot of focus on technology so right currently we are using ai or we do clinical research we do uh, we have advanced precision medicine um, <clears throat> we also do data analytics we are using tableau and power bi to really make sense out of big data that we for the patients uh, uh, uh thousands of patients that cross the network across the country and you know, a lot of these things have happened in this organization also but i think speaking at large uh, the issue is not with large 
separate hospital chains. It's 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 more with the smaller hospitals. It's more with the hospitals in tier two, three cities, standalone chains who don't have basic hygiene of you know hospital information system, e health records. They don't have ERPs. Um, they they don't even think of CRM. You know that's far fetched for them. So I think those are rudimentary scenarios where a lot of hygiene. uh uh technology needs to be brought about first and uh, for them the challenges are which i suppose would have been uh um apprehensions of these large chains also when they started say one decade back for them the challenges are also enumerated by others but at the cost of uh, at the risk of repeating i'll say first is change management of course uh, convincing uh, their uh, doctors and um, their their staff to use it training them there's a training expense um then there is a huge financial constraint of how do you justify the cost how do you get the return on the capital can you pass this cost to the patient that's already paying out of pocket largely uh, is he or she going to bear the cost if not um india has uh, still has bleak insurance cover and and payers are yet not ready to cover uh, these technology interventions so the cost of financing entire financing gamut is a problem um if, if whether the cost is passed to the patient or there is a pair that can uh, uh, that is ready to take the cost is a government ready to subsidize it um somebody mentioned about having a long term view i absolutely agree there are some solutions that pay for themselves for example what we did in covid i touched upon it when i i, I spoke last is we extended our critical care unit we set up a step down icu we used a host of remote monitoring devices which was an additional cost for us and we had to pay for it but uh, and we didn't pass the cost on to patients who were already crunched uh, and and some of them were credit patients sent by government and so on but that that solution paid for itself because at no extra cost of infrastructure or manpower that enabled us to just manage more patients and in a way it paid for itself in, in a two or three month time frame we did, we did not really incur incremental cost so there are some cost effective smart solutions i know there's a lot of health tech companies uh in the market now and some cost effective smart solutions that pay for themselves uh, we have doctors here you use a lot of who use a lot of technology in their clinics so i think now that adoption um um fear or apprehension among clinical community is far reduced i would say there is more of a barrier on the on the patient side rather than the doctor side where i see a lot of doctors using this technology in their own practice uh they uh they are on social media they use uh, uh, uh clinic uh, appointment management portals they use e prescription they use e health records they understand the use of it and uh, also a little bit talking about the system i think the other lacuna or the other uh, important aspect here to consider is uh integration and interoperability uh which is very important to ensure effective collaboration and communication between different systems and operations whether it is different systems in the same hospital ecosystem across different hospitals of a network group or across different hospital chains uh there has to be communication between this is different systems operations uh, that helps uh, and that makes it uh, uh, uh that makes the their seamless uh, uh trans data transmission of data seamless uh safe and secure of course this is whole angle of uh data security um uh data privacy um one that is covered by regulatory guidelines um i know that a lot of applications today are hepa certified they have hn7 they ensure this kind of data data security but that's also something that needs to be kept in mind uh, so keeping all these things in mind i think ultimately uh change management i would say in implementing these and cost of financing i think these are the two things to be kept in mind if not hurdles these are considerations that would enable any hospital chain to adopt more technology very important point uh, data privacy security part and also uh, leveraging cost effective smart digital solutions which are there now a uh, very important point and the cost part as well uh, uh, thanks manisha for those insights uh, uh we don't have much time but one question to be asked so i'll request all of you to just take one or two minutes to share your perspective on that that infection prevention and control should be an ongoing hospital activity uh challenges and opportunities are we ready for that kind of ecosystem uh, rajarajan your thoughts on that quickly a minute or so 
See, uh, infection control practices has been uh, followed very, uh, uh, you know, uh, routinely in all hospitals, uh, be it smallest of small uh, nursing homes. Uh, we do still get the smell of Dettol and all those uh, agents when we do enter them. So the practice has to get uh, uh, more systematic in a way. Uh, it, that, there should not be any monitoring required for the practice, but it should be a habitual and stuff. So that is where the transformation is going to happen. Uh, there are a lot of uh, tools and uh, stuff also to do that. Uh, in, and off late, uh, there are a lot of new agents which are uh, coming, which are more far more superior in uh, this thing. One of the important thing over here is uh, about the kind of uh, communication systems uh, that which we have uh, to ensure that uh, such infection control practices are better. And as a nation, uh, we, we look at collaborating with uh, best practices in different hospitals to enhance the community, uh, uh, you know, infection control practice uh, so that uh, we, we have been considerably able to get that uh, with respect to uh, reduction in uh, CAP and uh, WAP and, uh, you know, this thing. So these communicable diseases also is something which uh, we would be looking at where we will get bring together all our best practices uh, and start with the thing. One thing which is very unique to healthcare is there are no competitors in this space. We're all uh, uh, we're all uh, working together for the good health of the community, uh, and uh, that way uh, the best practice sharing uh, between organizations is going to really be a great uh, step forward with respect to hospital infection control practices. And more than uh, importantly, it's not just the hospital infection control mm -hmm. nurse or the infection control team or the committee, which has to be leading it. It has to be every one of us, uh, be it at the hospital or uh, at the home, or even while you are out there in any of the public areas and stuff. We do see a lot of anomalies nowadays. Uh, people who don't wear masks, but we all long for the days when we don't have to wear masks. Uh, inside the closed room like this, we can talk about it. We can not uh, wear masks and be. But uh, out there, it is not. Uh, so we still need to educate a lot of people uh, on infection control practices. We need to be prudent in our measures. And uh, this is all going to be, the collective effort is going to be something which we will reap rich uh, rewards and benefits out of. <coughs> thanks, right. fellow. Thanks, thanks, Roger Rajan. Yes, sir. Uh, Arja Kurian, quickly, your thoughts on that. A minute or so minute. to you. Yes. Um, so uh, infection control, again, I agree with what Mr. Rajaran said. It's it's not one person's responsibility. It's not a team. It's, it's every healthcare worker's responsibility. And it has been for so many years. You know, uh, uh, one thing is, see, in all these infection control practices like hand rub, you know, the cuffing e etiquette, all of this has been known for many years before, but it's just very recently that it gained more widespread importance. And uh, um, we need to be continuing those practices. We have to have them imbibed into our system, not with just the staff working there, but among the patients as well, so that we become better prepared to respond to other outbreaks and recover faster. Now, uh, in terms of infection control, it's, as he just said, uh, it's not just about the monitoring aspect. Uh, it's also about uh, a third party view. Now see nurses, doctors, they are so engrossed in their daily routine of patient care. They are best at patient care. But there are times when a third party reviewing their uh, activity or the way the care has been executed, particularly when we talk about care bundles being given, you know, for specific uh, uh, conditions. Uh, the adherence of the care bundle, you know, how well it's being executed. Is there a positive factor that is creating a, a sudden surge in some sort of a, 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 you know, in one of the indicators? Uh, you need to have a, a group that is uh, apart from the uh, nursing or the medical community that stands aside and actually reviews all of these aspects. So uh, I do believe that that surveillance is also an important element uh, in infection control uh, prevention. And um, you see, last year, our uh, International Infection Control Prevention Week, the, uh, the theme was make your intention infection prevention. So uh, again, that was reiterating the fact that it's everyone's responsibility. So um, a lot of training does need to go into making that happen because whether it's the housekeeper who is carrying out the biomedical waste or whether it's the security who is uh, uh, assigned to 
send in the bystander of a patient in the ICU, each one of them need to be told why it is important that they need to follow these uh, um, practices. Uh, so that kind of education, all of that happens when you have an infection uh, uh, team, you know, a control team there. And of course, now many of our hospitals do also have an infectious diseases specialist uh, who works along with the microbiologist, and they are even able to uh, study the uh, antibiotic uh, consumption, the prescriptions. They are able to um, uh, get uh, you know valuable information out of that. They are able to understand the antibiogram of the organization. Uh, they are able to communicate, talk to the doctor, uh, give alerts. Sometimes, in fact, we have an app that helps us to escalate and de-escalate uh, antibiotics. Um, we check the dependencies on third generation antibiotics. So those kind of activities are also very much a part of the infection uh, control and prevention team. And it goes a long way in impacting the, the community as well. So uh, definitely we, uh, we uh, firmly believe that the infection control team is an essentiality. It could be one nurse, it could be uh, a nurse with an ID doctor, or a microbiologist, but definitely a team that needs to look at these different aspects. You know, a little bit of surveillance, a little bit of training, uh, all of these aspects need to come into place for us to be able to uh, respond better in the, uh, you know, in case of another outbreak happening, right? So that's my point of view. Thank you. Right, right. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Dr. Vijay, your thoughts on that quickly, a minute or so. <clears throat> Only thing I think, I think Adra and uh, uh, Rajarajan has, have covered that. Uh, one is it is on the top of the list, definitely, to impact the outcomes, the clinical outcomes when it comes to the healthcare. <coughs> and I think audit of infection control practices is, is a good thing to, uh, to have in place, uh, which, will, which will focus on, on the gaps in the infection control uh, protocols and also to focus on the training and retraining across board. So the involvement of manpower, not only uh, nurses, but also housekeeping, the admin staff, the management team members, the infection control, and in gross uh, 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 involvement of the team across board. So that I think, I think it is very important and also to imbibe it as a culture, though it is a part of the accreditation norms, right? It is, it is set in as a practice, no doubt, but I think all whatever we talk is is has to be across board among the smaller hospitals, the midline hospitals, the uh, medium sized hospitals, as well as the large corporate. Anyways, I think most of the protocols will be in place. So I think I think it's on the top of the list. No doubt. Audit of uh, infection control practices, a very important point uh, raised by Dr. Vijay Singh. Manisha, your thoughts on that quickly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, infection control is paramount uh, in any hospital to ensure better, uh, the right clinical outcomes, rather. Uh, most of the hospitals have infection control committees, they have infection control nurses, uh, infection control officers, could be a microbiologist, they have link nurses. And so those are very uh, basic protocols. Uh, like Dr. Vijay said, they are also required by accrediting bodies. Uh, so these are essential to have, but largely I think as a as a as a theme uh, or as a culture, it needs to be driven from the top because we are hospitals, and for us uh, patients are a priority. So while our our cultural theme can also be integrity, teamwork, excellence, I think infection can be uh, completely part and parcel of that. It, could be, uh, you know, a KRA of everybody in the hospital. It really needs to go into the job roles of everyone in patient facing roles and otherwise, uh, whether they are on role or outsourced. And I think everyone should be made to feel the, uh, the, the importance of it. It's not just in clinical outcomes, also reduces burden of cost on the hospital and the patient. Hospital acquired infection is unnecessary cost, both for the patient and the hospital, and also uh, is, is important as, as just as uh, maintaining a goodwill uh, image in the catchment. So I think um, uh, it's quite important to evangelize infection control in this way and educate uh, everyone and, and drive it as a cultural thing. Right, 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 right. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, we end this session with your thoughts. 
Well, um, yes, infection prevention and control is a very important aspect. And I see that it has come a long way from what it was. I've been into this infection control for the last 20 years. Uh, at that point in time, there was no data about infection control. And we all believed that ignorance is bliss. And we were happy about it. But what I'm happy to see is currently at least the data is available. So that's one part which is done. What are we doing about it? I think we still have a long way to go in that segment as well. Um, the reason for that is there are a lot of hospitals which are implementing care bundles. And I'm actually doing a current interesting because I'm doing a market research across the country, across hospitals, across private segments, government segments and charitables and trying to identify people. Why does infection still happen? Um, you know, we all agree that one bloodstream infection in the ICU would extend the stay by about seven to ten days which will increase the cost of treatment by at least one and a half lakhs a day, which includes the high, very high in antibiotics. We all know that. So why does it happen still? And so when you're interviewing different people, when you're interviewing the intensivists, when you're interviewing the nurses and trying to identify and understand the challenge, they still feel that there are gaps in the bundles. And why do gaps happen in the bundles? Because everybody of us works in silos. And there are gaps because nobody's speaking to each other. And the team, which is supposed to be putting the, uh, you know, central line or working on the VAP or working on the urinary tract infections or SSIs, the surgeon is working on a silo with the infection control nurses working on a silo and everybody else is working on a silos. And, and, and when I complete the report, and I can share it with all of you, is that, um, you know, we will, I would be very surprised to see various uh, different things coming out of it. Now, if you, uh, if I go and ask, if, if I see an infection control nurse in the hospital, trust me, they are the most cared person in the hospital. And I feel very sad for those poor girls because there are only two or three of them in the whole hospital, which is very large. They are supposed to do monitoring or auditing the entire hospital. It's practically not possible. Um, it's a very challenging job for them. And therefore, I find data all over the place. And when you go through and scrutinize the data, is there is either gross underreporting or there is fudging of data. Those are the only two conclusions I can come out of it. You know, so... Yes, we have a long way to go and we need to be and, and the good part is and I'm happy that, you know, almost all the hospitals are working towards it, and that's the right way to go. Antibiotic stewardship program. Yes, it's on paper. How much is it getting implemented? Yeah, there are challenges. Um, you know, um, infection rates in the hospital. Yes, we are trying to address how much is getting implemented. Yes, there are challenges. So like healthcare has got multiple segments where we have challenges in almost every aspects of what we are doing. So I think there has to be a dedicated work on each aspects of it and, and therefore to you know take the problem and the scruff of the neck and try to solve it. And that's the only way we'll be able to um, uh, you know solve. And I like what Mr. Rajaram said. You know, he said that we should be able to work with other hospitals also. And that is the most important thing. Collaboration in spite of competition is the only way for the better of betterment of health. While we may compete with each other in terms of our you know, revenue or our brand or whatever it is, but collaboration still has to happen. If you're able to share our infection rates with each other, if you're trying to find what are you doing better than to improve our rates, and that collaborative of work will is the only way to improve our infection rates. Otherwise, we still keep talking about infection control, and I don't think we have solved it yet. Um, that's only one part of it, right? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam, strategic advisor, you to the hospitals. Thank you so much, Raja Rajanes, CEO, Chief Operating Officer of MGM Healthcare, Dr. Vijay Singh Narayana Health, uh, Manisha Kumar, Cluster Chief Operating Officer, HCG Hospitals, and Adra Kurian, Chief Strategic Management Officer, Rajagiri Hospital, for sharing your thoughts on the various aspect of uh, re strategizing hospital management to fulfill the needs of the new world order. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? If I take a crux of what have been discussed for the last one hour, one is the, that emergency management committee, no shying away from that, that has to be there. And the importance of EMC uh, has been felt like never before. We all agreed to that. Uh, in terms of technology, technology is again, no option. It is a necessity. But we have to think that whether to embrace newer technologies or we should also take use of the existing technologies that Dr. Prabhu and also uh, Adra Kurian spoke about. The local digital solutions are already there. Uh, and also uh, taking care of people, which Rajarajan spoke in the very uh, beginning. Uh, and the cost-effective smart solutions, uh, which Manisha talked about, and especially he also focused on the part of data, the data privacy and data security. 
And in the end, uh, as Dr. Vijay has also said about the uh, realization of the critical aspect of uh, emergency management committee, that is also important. And at the end, we all, uh, and also another point in, in terms of uh, infection prevention and control, the habitual practice should be there, should not be enforced. We should all, as out of habit, we should have those things in place. We should use our mask, a sanitizer, and the sanitization should happen. But audit of infection control practices, as Dr. Vijay has pointed out, that is also very important. So I think that has been the crux of uh, what has been discussed for last one hour. It's again a pleasure to have you all here today for this panel discussion. I again thank Rajan S, Dr. Vijay Singh, Manisha Kumar, Adra Kurian, and Dr. Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam for joining us today. But before we end, we have a small token of recognition from our end to all of you. Can we have the uh, certificates on screen, please? The certificate of appreciation presented to Raja Raja Ness, Chief Operating Officer, MGM Healthcare, for the dedicated efforts of exemplary work in the healthcare. Congratulations, Raja Raja, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, can we have the next certificate on screen, please, Dr. Dr. Vijay Singh, Directions, Operations, and Medical Services, Karnataka Cluster, Narayana Health, for his dedicated efforts and exemplary work in healthcare. Congratulations, sir. Can we have the next uh, certificate on screen, please? to Manisha Kumar, Cluster Chief Operating Officer, HCG Hospitals, again, for her dedicated efforts and exemplary work in the healthcare sector. We congratulate Manisha. Thank you for joining us today. And to Adja Kurian, Chief Strategic Management Officer, Rajagiri Hospital, for her dedicated efforts and exemplary work in the healthcare. We congratulate Adja Kurian. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us today. And to Dr. Prabhu Vinayagam, Strategic Advisor, Ishada Hospitals, again for his dedicated efforts exemplary work in the healthcare and also for his critical role uh, in our panel discussion today in terms of uh, showing what needs to be done more thank you so much all of you uh, who will be part of the fourth edition of apec health Tech innovation conclave this brings us to the end of day one do join us tomorrow at 11 a.m for many more sessions interesting sessions to gain more insights on how to make a resilient healthcare ecosystem of future. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Take care. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you all. Thank you.